This is Digital Music Trends, episode 133, recorded on the 23rd of May 2013. This week on the show, Songkick opens up Detour and partners with SoundCloud, Spotify has its own chart, Tumblr is acquired by Yahoo, impressions on Google Play, Merlin's numbers, Deezer and the US, Pandora and more. Well, hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, uh, the weekly show that brings you the latest news in the digital music industry with some great insights from our rotating panel of guests. So this week, here on the show, I'm super happy to welcome back Virginie Berger from Paris, founder of digital agency Don't Believe the Hype, uh, that works uh, with creative and marketing strategies and development to accompany individual artists, uh, cultural industries and emerging entertainment technologies. So hi Virginie and great to have you on, how's it going? Very well, thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks for being on once again, and also thanks very happy to. Uh, it's always great to have you, and uh, always uh, great to have Duncan Gere as well uh, from Gothenburg, a uh, freelance Hello. journalist, and currently also studying for a master in environmental science. So hi, Duncan, and all good. Yes, everything is wonderful. Great, awesome, and uh, and I was very jealous. Uh, you said that you were going to the semi-final of the Eurovision uh, last week. Yes, it was incredible. <laughs> it was the most amazing experience. I've never seen so many flags in my life. <laughs> It's amazing. It's like meeting at the at the Olympics, but with bad music. <laughs> exactly. And much more enthusiasm, generally. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. That uh, sounds good. Yeah, I saw the final because I I don't I, I never want to spoil myself uh, by watching the semi final because then the surprise element is taken away. I mean, <laughs> otherwise, stuff like the Romanian act, you would have never like had the same reaction if you'd already seen it before. It was kind of it was kind of unbelievable. But, uh, yeah, and if it, you does, had... it does mean that you get double the crazy acts, though, because there were some dubstep spacemen from Montenegro <laughs> in my semi-final that never made it quite through to the final. So. I know. I hope they're going to make a show with like all the outtakes of people that didn't make it through to the final, so you can just that watch those. Great. That would be actually quite oh, good. Yeah. And, 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 and for any American uh, listeners or from other parts of the world that don't know what we're talking about, uh, you should Google on YouTube. No, you should YouTube actually uh, Eurovision and Romania and and have a taster of of, of the kind of stuff that goes on. <laughs> At this uh, songwriting competition with uh, inverted commas. Uh, great. So, <laughs> so this week I want to start uh, by talking about a company that works very much incrementally, uh, but without making a you know, huge impact uh, with you know big items of news. Uh, but that has worked to become the second biggest uh, uh, music uh, live music site uh, uh, in the world. And so, of course, I'm talking about uh, Songkick. And the company had a couple of uh, interesting uh, uh, things uh, happening this week. So I think it's worth opening with them as we haven't really covered the company much on the show and talking about what they're doing. So uh, first of all, uh, Songkick uh, opened up their detour project to the whole of London uh, uh, late last week. And uh, uh, they also partnered with SoundCloud to link into artists' profiles uh, um, with the uh, song kick listings, so gig listings from their platform. So first of all, I'm going to talk about Detour, and Detour is a platform that essentially allows fans to request a gig by their favorite artists, uh, so that they can, you know, pledge to buy a ticket if the artist commits to come to their to their hometown. And in this case, of course, it's London, as the beta program was was launched here, and it's still limited to uh, to uh, London uh, at, at this point. And so uh, Detour started a few months ago, and they only had a very limited beta pro product with a uh, thousand users. Uh, but even uh, with that limited amount of people, they managed to uh, organize 10 very successful gigs in the capital with uh, sort of small to medium sized artists. And now the platform has been opened up to all Londoners. And uh, this was announced by the company's CEO, Ian Hogarth, uh, uh, at the Great Escape, uh, uh, I think it was last uh, Thursday, or uh, Thursday or Friday. And, uh, um, and so, you know, the, the, the goal of the company is to really empower the middle class musician who maybe doesn't really know where, where the audience is or you know they, they would like to play in a, somewhere like London but they're not sure whether the gig would be financially sustainable and so the fact that fans can pledge to buy a ticket gives them a lot more security and and takes away the risk of uh, organizing a, a gig that might not be in their hometown. So uh, first of all guys uh, what do you think of Detour and what do you make of this uh, opening up of the platform to, to a city that is uh, you know eight and a half million people so it's a pretty big uh, beta project at this point. I mean, I think crowdfunding is very much taking over the world at the moment, and it's, yeah. and it's really interesting to see how that's happening in, in all kinds of sectors, not just live music. But having said that, I think that there's definitely much more of an application in terms of live music than there is in perhaps funding an album or, or something like that. Um, I think there's a lot of very large artists who are, who are trying to get money from these 
crowdfunding services, you know, claiming that it gives them more artistic independence and so on. And yeah, that might be true. But I think there's a lot more to be said for applying this to a concept of a live audience where, as you say, you might not know quite whether the market is there. We don't really have those kinds of analytics, though, as I think we're going to be talking about later in the show. Those these things are kind of be, being developed as we as we speak with digital music services. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Virginie, uh, from from uh, you know from your perspective, uh, what what do you think that this could bring to the table for artists that want to, yeah. uh, you know, because you work also with, the, with sort of medium sized artists. So so what, what what kind of benefits do you think it could bring to them? Uh, I, I agree with with Duncan about crowdfunding, but. Um, you know, some platform tried uh, in France to do the same thing uh, about tour and concerts, but um, they did not succeed. Yeah. Big, big, big problems. Uh, because maybe different in France, maybe because of the, I don't know, rights, because of everything. But um, really, uh, they did not succeed in uh, convincing fans yeah. to pay for concerts. So yeah. I think it's very, very interesting for for um, artists and maybe record labels and uh, maybe booking agencies, really, it's very interesting. But for me, it's for a certain kind of artists, artists, sorry, because you need a fan base. Um, so yes, it's really interesting, but <laughs> it's not for all the artists and it's yeah. not for all the countries. Yeah, of course, and, and uh, the ultimate goal, of course, of Sunkick would be to bring this uh, to uh, a big audience and, and, and take it worldwide, yeah. of course, uh, uh, eventually. But, uh, I mean, the, 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 the main concern is that from, from our organizational perspective, of course, you know, you can't just uh, get the fans to pledge for a ticket and then, uh, poof, automatically the gig happens. There's a lot of yeah. stuff that happens in between, which, which means, you know, you have to deal with a, with a booking agent, you have to book a venue, you have to, uh, you, you have know, to organize. With venues, you, have to, you have to deal with the perception companies because in France, for example, with SASM, yeah. you, you can't do what you want <laughs> with concerts and, and booking. Oh, so, even, yeah. even, so they're involved in that, on that side of things as well? Yeah, exactly. All oh, right. Exactly. Right. That's very interesting. So you have to deal, you have to deal with SASM too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Duncan, do you think that it's it's scalable? I mean, of course, in London, uh, I'm sure the company has a, a lot of hookups with the promoters. But if they start taking it to different cities, then it, it becomes a lot more of a of a logistical challenge to actually have staff on the ground that can help organize these events. Yeah, I mean, I think the the both the pro and the con of the service is that it directly involves money, that it involves you know fans forking over cash, and that makes things very very difficult in terms of handling that money and how you keep that secure and on all sorts of those those things. That's not something that Songkick has had to deal with before, and it will have to get in a lot of expertise to be able to do that. Yeah. And then, as Virginie says, the the actual you know. Translating that to a local area, making sure that you've got bookers and promoters and so on ready in the local area to take advantage of this, this cash that suddenly arrived is another challenge on top of that. So I think what we'll see is probably a regional rollout. I mean, it will be fairly easy to expand it out to the rest of Britain. But then once you want to start moving in other currencies, then you have to start worrying about regulations in different countries. This is something that Kickstarter has had an awful lot of difficulty with, and they've only moved one country outside of the US so far. Yeah. So I think we'll see fairly slow progress in terms of a rollout around the whole world. Yeah, and uh, it was interesting to think about um, Topspin, because uh, um, you know, they actually had uh, an interesting proposition on that front, uh, I think two or even three years ago, when they did that gig uh, of the Pixies at the Troxy. So that was pretty groundbreaking in terms of allowing fans to have their own tickets, and they organized the whole thing, and they were just scanning tickets on the door with, uh, with iPhones. But then uh, that all went quiet, and I really haven't heard about them organizing other events like that, probably for, for logistical issues. Uh, Virginia, do you think there's a, there's a, that the logistical side is, is why Topspin didn't get more involved in the live side? Oh yes, <laughs> exactly. I agree with you. It's yeah. it's really really complicated. Um, in France, you know, top spin doesn't work uh, a lot. It's because of the long wage and because of the technical stuff and everything. But um, we have a platform. It's um, uh, my tool manager. Uh, it's quite the same thing, and uh, they failed because of the lo logistical issues and because of the right issues and because they didn't build partnerships with uh, producers and touring company and, and uh, perception companies. So, yeah, it's not only logistic, it's uh, you have to build partnerships, you have to be close to the people yeah. <laughs> from, uh, the, from the industry and you have to be close to, to SASM and, percep and perception companies. So, yeah, you have to deal with uh, a lot of people. That's why probably 
it was a the problem with top spin. Yeah, yeah, and Nakhon, do you think Top Spin may have missed the boat? Uh, you know, they could have developed, been developing this uh, sort of uh, as a forefront thing for a couple of years now, but I haven't really seen much on that on that front. Do you think? Yeah, they, exactly. What what what, yeah. what do you reckon, Duncan? Is is that something that they they should have been focusing on? I mean, it's 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 hard to say, really. Yeah. It, it's it's easy to kind of like look back with hindsight, you know, ten years later and say, well, yes, yeah. that could have worked. But at this point, it, everything is very much in flux, and and working out where the smart place to put. You know, resources is is quite a tough job. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and of course, you know, it makes complete sense for Songkick because they are the live music destination for a lot of people now. So, uh, the the vertical works a lot better, I think, in their direction also because they're yeah. they're a consumer facing service, so they have a large audience of people that actually actively go on the platform just for kicks, you know, to find out what's going on and and give song kicks. Song kicks, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, well, uh, the other uh, uh, thing about uh, um, Songkick, actually, what I wanted to just, to just briefly uh, mention was the fact that they've finally integrated with the SoundCloud so that uh, artists can easily just add their Songkick URL to their SoundCloud profile and the, 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 the next three gigs will show up on, on the sidebar just next to, the, to, their, uh, to their sounds, to their, to their songs. And, and that's quite interesting because it means that it gives uh, them a, a, a much better sort of integration between people discovering uh, somebody's music because SoundCloud is, has been touted by a lot of people that I, that I know, at least uh, within the industry, as one of the best uh, discovery platforms for music. And, and, and certainly the way that they listen to a lot of the, the new music that comes across uh, their Twitter feed and, and translating that into ticket sales if somebody really falls in love with your song. So uh, do you think it's uh, something that, you know, of course it makes complete sense and uh, is, is it going to drive more, is going to benefit more SoundCloud or Songkick, Virginie? I think it's a um, terrific idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, it's, it's very smart and it's so interesting for the artists, for SoundCloud and for Songkick. So, no, really, for me, it's it's very very good, yeah. really. So I have not really have a, I don't really have an opinion about that because, you know, when you listen to music on SoundCloud and you want to have more information about the artist and you can check uh, the content, so that's great. That's great. So that's great yeah. for the artist. That's, that's great for Soundkick and that's great for SoundCloud. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's very very good services from uh, from SoundCloud. It's a good service. It's um, it's very good for some cases. So, for yeah. it's perfect. <laughs> Yeah, and and Duncan, I guess I guess you probably have the same point. Like in terms of uh, you know, SoundCloud now reaches over 200 million people, I think a, a month, uh, and uh, Soundkick yeah. also being the second biggest uh, you know music live music site in the world. So it's just a, a great match. And uh, anything to add on that? No, not really. I mean, I think it's as as Virginie said, it's good. It's good for everyone. It's good for the consumer, the artist, SoundCloud and Songkick. It's not like SoundCloud wants to suddenly jump into concerts, and it's not like Songkick suddenly wants to jump into streaming music. So yeah. it, it it makes sense for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And so I wanted to move on to talk about uh, Spotify and the charts. So Spotify unveiled uh, yesterday uh, that uh, you know that they're rolling out a new uh, chart, uh, or actually two new charts that are to do with their internal data. So it's quite interesting, and they're going to have the Spotify fifty chart uh, rolled out that looks at the tracks that are streamed the most in any given country whilst the social 50 chart looks at the tracks that are being shared the most in uh, on uh, social networks uh, and this will be uh, this is rolled out across uh, all the 28 countries where spotify is present and they also provide a very nice little embed uh, widget that you can you can use you can just set uh, the type of chart that you want you can set the country that you want it to to show um, uh, in the forefront and then you can just embed it on your own site which is pretty cool and uh, so this is uh, this is pretty interesting Interesting, and uh, it's also interesting that, that the way that they've built it, because I've noticed that some tracks appear on both charts, for example, but some tracks that should appear on both charts don't. Uh, so I wonder whether there's any filtering going on to try and make sure that the, the two charts are not replicating each other. And also, it's interesting because it kind of it feels like, it feels like it's some, something that competes a little bit uh, with some of the other charts products that are offered out there and uh, specifically for example something like the next big sound uh, social 50 which actually has the same name as uh, as this chart uh, so uh, you know is this another another way of uh, spotify opening up their data and uh, just uh, trying to become more relevant as uh, as a, pl a go-to platform and a premier uh, place where people consume their music uh, duncan I mean, I don't think it's terribly useful for the users. It's going to be a list of fifty terrible songs in most cases. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 kind of interesting. I think it's probably going to be more useful for 
bands and their PR people to basically say, yeah, we got to number X on the top 50 lift to try and get journalists to write about them and for their music stores to stock them and, and so yeah. on. It's not, it, it doesn't blow my mind as a user. Yeah, yeah. So a, a marketing play for, for you, Virginia, as well? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm very sad because Daft Punk is only the second. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, sorry for my throat. <clears throat> yeah, Daft Punk is, is only the second. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's interesting, but, um, you know, it's quite the same chart as iTunes. Yeah. You know, uh, there's not a lot of indies and uh, emerging artists. It's, uh, it's Michael Moore, and Michael Moore is very good, I agree. But it's Michael Moore, it's Daft Punk, it's Justin Timberlake, it's Pink, uh, it's Bruno Mars. So, yeah, um, I mean, it's terrific for, for PR, for record labels, for artists, but it's for the same kind of artists and PR and record, label, record labels. Um, we work on a billboard and you know, everything, so it's, it's not an, in, an indie chart. Yeah. It's a major company chart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And it, so it's very different from, from the likes of something that, for example, Twitter tried to put forward with their with their you know emerging uh, chart in the in the Twitter music Twitter app Twitter music is a flop but yeah Twitter music is not working at all like yeah. we, we actually mentioned it a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, you know where we actually went went through all the numbers of where they are in the app store and you know they are now they are ranking even lower so uh, so that's kind of a shame but at the same time it was a very restrictive service at least for now yeah, yeah, I mean I think it yeah. can it can actually come Let's back see. it can come back if they integrate something like SoundCloud or something like uh, you know um, Vivo for example uh, so that they people can actually listen to free music but uh, I don't know uh, Duncan do you reckon if Twitter music can, can make a comeback if they integrate <laughs> new stuff? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, it can do. I'm, I'm not convinced that it necessarily will. I yeah. mean, I, I was, to, to change the subject ever so slightly, yeah, I was sure. having a really interesting discussion on Twitter with Sean Adams from Drowned in Sound the other day, and we were kind of talking about how almost every um, uh, major broadsheet music article starts with a list of n numbers from social networks works yeah. now these days you know it's they're the biggest band on YouTube or something like that and and we were kind of wondering whether the whether this social media popularity is kind of taking the place of music writers actual opinions in deciding what they cover <laughs> yeah that's I mean, a good what, point. what do you guys think about that <laughs> that's a very good point uh, yeah but I would like you know about Spotify I would like Spotify to make shouts about um, Indie and rock and pop, maybe because this one it's like really it's like iTunes, so it's like the billboard. It's it's <laughs> there's no difference <laughs> yeah. between iTunes and Spotify, even if I really like Michael Moore. But you know, sometimes you want to discover, you want to, to really you want to discover, you, you want to listen to new music, and um, it's exactly the same. I mean, I, I've listened to a lot of people talk about uh. The way they discover music also from labels and from yeah. publishers and management agencies in the last few weeks because i've been to liverpool sound city and uh, the great escape and i've seen quite a few panels happening there and most of them actually do say that although social media numbers can be influential when it comes to the to the final decision they are also quite happy to work with acts that do not have those stats if the music is really great so i mean <laughs> at least at least you know what they're saying is is comforting me a little bit in the sense that it, it, it doesn't seem like they're just looking at numbers uh, even though for example radio stations may be just looking at numbers uh, these days but uh, but yeah. uh, from a journalistic perspective i don't really know about music size because i don't really cover music directly but in terms of startups uh, i mean that doesn't really influence me that much you know if a startup has a million users or Hundred thousand users, or you know, five million users. At the end of the day, you don't even you don't even really ever know what those metrics mean, because people always start figures, and you don't really know if that means you know that these users are active, how many of those are active, what the churn of a company is, and so even if a company is doing really well, they might have just spent a lot of money in marketing and and gotten a big spike in users by doing a huge amount of Facebook advertising, for example. But that doesn't automatically translate into into a great product that is going to stick around. So I think I think from my from my perspective on the tech side. I don't look at numbers ultimately as, as the main way to, to select which companies, for example, I interview for the one-to-one -one show. Uh, Duncan, do you reckon that that's, that's the trend? Or Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we'll kind of see, but it's easier than ever to get those numbers, and so they're, they're sort of gaining more weight for, for that reason. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think <laughs> it sounds like your approach is, is probably the right one to take them into account but not make it the 
ultimate be all and end all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the vision is you find a lot of pressure from uh, people you talk to when you're pitching artists, for example, to to show show numbers. Oh yes, it's always and only about numbers, only. Uh, from radio station to record labels to even booking agency. It's always about view on YouTube and, and plays on, on Spotify and yeah, only. Only about numbers. That's, a, that's yeah, kind of a shame. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Uh, and, the, and the next story, actually, Virginie, uh, was something that, that we talked about a few months ago back at Medium. So uh, this is the biggest uh, tech news story of the week. And uh, music is only you know, a very small part of it. Uh, but uh, that's the acquisition of uh, Tumblr by Yahoo for $1.1 billion in cash. So this is a, not strictly a music tech news, but Tumblr had, has had a fairly heavy push uh, to try and involve more artists and bands into the platform. And uh, we were talking at, at back at Medium about how impressed we were about their functionalities that they did. That they've added and the way that they were trying to uh, sort of uh, reach out to the artist community and uh, also I had interviewed uh, Nate Auerbach uh, over in Cannes who is in charge of the music strategy and outreach so uh, you know of course with every acquisition there are naysayers that start moving their blog uh, straight away to a different platform for example WordPress uh, said that they had over 75,000 uh, migrations from Tumblr right after uh, the announcement which of course of course is only a, a drop in the ocean compared to the number of Tumblr blogs uh, yeah. that, that are on the platform but uh, you know do you think there are any potential drawbacks or potential synergies and, and positive points uh, uh, with the uh, tumblr being associated with yahoo now i hope yahoo is not like facebook or twitter <laughs> yeah. really because you know when when facebook or twitter uh buy a new company it's not a good news for the company so so um Really, I don't know. Really, I don't know because it, you know it's 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 too fresh. It's new. Uh, so right now, I don't know. Uh, Tumblr is very very good for music and for the artists because um, you know you can create your Tumblr and you, you don't even have to create a, a website. You only have to put some pictures and and, and um, you know they have a partnership with SoundCloud, so you only have to put your your music and your video and it's perfect. So. Yeah. Yeah, for for the artist, um, it's it's Tumblr is just so good. So I really don't know what Yahoo wants to do with Tumblr. Yeah. I don't know if they want to change the name from Tumblr Yahoo. For example. No, I don't know not. Tumblr Who. <laughs> <laughs> I, really, I don't know. <laughs> Tumblr Who, so, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, Tumblr Who, yeah, maybe we don't know. <laughs> so, but you know, uh, when Twitter bought a music, uh, it's not it's. Uh, we are we are hunted. Yeah. Uh, really, it was a great news, but uh, they did nothing with uh, we are hunted. I mean, they they did Twitter music, but Twitter music we don't know. So yeah. for the moment, really, I'm not sure. For me, how is so old? <laughs> so you know, it's difficult to 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 see Yahoo with Tumblr. So. You know, but some lights are flicker, so maybe that's something, you know, maybe they want to buy all the companies with only Tumblr and Flickr, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Companies that drop, drop vowels, essentially. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but they don't have to screw. It's exactly yeah. uh, the title of the, of the article. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Duncan, do you think there's any, like, you know, AOL, for example, did a bunch of content acquisitions that ended up ah, being yes. pretty pretty good for the company. And uh, do you yeah. think that Yahoo is also looking at that and thinking, you know, there's a lot of great content on Tumblr that uh, is not being monetized right now and perhaps provide an alternative avenue for exposure for artists that have successful Tumblrs on Yahoo? It's possible. I mean, it, it, when it comes to Yahoo, you kind of have to look at the last two major big acquisitions of the same type they did, which are Flickr, as you mentioned, and Delicious. And... Both of those have just kind of gone mm, like <laughs> yeah. that, and it hasn't it hasn't been good. I mean, having said that, um, they timed terribly timed an announcement of a massive rehaul of Flickr to go with their um, Tumblr announcement. And actually, the rehaul of Flickr, I've I've only looked at it very briefly. It actually looks pretty good and pretty modern. And it seems like their new CEO, Marissa Mayer, formerly of Google fame, is actually might be trying to change the company's path somewhat in a way that will be a lot more successful than their last few CEOs. Yeah. It remains to be seen how effective that will be in the long term, but in the short term, I think for most people, nothing is going to change. Yeah. yeah. 
absolutely oh. it's, it's, it's gonna be like instagram and facebook right now yeah. nothing's really changed uh, for for them but but we'll see whether that but will, one will continue billion. yeah one billion one billion i think investors are going to start asking questions of, in, in a year or so so why do you invest at one billion what, what's happening with that company that you invested in <laughs> are you doing anything exactly. with it <laughs> exactly uh cool well and uh, the of course we have to touch upon uh, the google uh, play music all access story so google launched the subscription service uh, uh, last wednesday night and last week we actually recorded dmt uh, before this was announced but thanks to a leak by the verge and the uh, new york times we already had the fact it's pretty much uh, all spot on and we're able to comment accordingly. Of course, the only things that we didn't know were, you know, price points and, and feature sets and the service will uh, be a similar, you know, priced exactly the same as Spotify in the US at $9.99 uh, per month, uh, aside from an introductory pricing of $7.99 for those who sign up before June 30th. And so it's, it's kind of a couple of bucks saving per month if you sign up and, and switch uh, right now. Uh, uh, Google also used the, the line uh, radio without rules, so which kind of uh, t takes a bit of a shot at both Pandora and, and, and Spotify in the sense that you know they really wanted to stress the simplicity with which you can access uh, for example radio stations on, on the service and and the listen now feature where you can you, they line up for you a bunch of tracks that they think you're gonna like uh, and so you know there's been a lot of articles talking about the, the pros and the cons of the new service and for me uh, I don't see it making a big splash to be honest uh, until Google rolls out a YouTube service it's gonna it's gonna be a relatively small small service even if the base of android users is, so, is huge uh but uh, I, I don't know like uh, do you have any uh, any thoughts duncan after hearing the announcement and on on what people might make of this well i mean the one thing we didn't know this time last week is that is what it was going to be called and google play <laughs> all access music is probably the worst title for a streaming music service that i've heard since nokia's comes with music it's it's awful um, it, it just sounds like you can't imagine them sitting there saying, well, let's call it, um, it's, got, it's got to have music in because it's a music service and, and all access. Yeah, we want to call it all access, but it's got to have Google Play in there too. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It sounds like a Microsoft um, decision, doesn't it? It really does. And that, that gives me actually quite a lot to worry about because Google never used yeah. to be like this. Um, yeah. And they, they seem to be changing in a much, much more Microsoft y direction, which I don't like. Oh. Um, in terms of the actual service itself, it isn't very exciting. It doesn't do anything that Spotify doesn't really do already. Spotify does other stuff better. It has more um, features and functionality. It's easier to use. I can't see in its current state it gaining an awful lot of traction. Yeah. Virginia, what, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I fully agree with Duncan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. absolutely. And especially about the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Googleization. <laughs> Uh, but you know, in France, um, I'm not sure if we can have uh, Google Music in France because of the same and everything as usual. So I don't even know if we can, if I can try Google Music. Yeah. But as you know, we have Deezer in France, so it can be difficult for Google. Yeah. Yeah, but I actually agree with Duncan for the other side. <laughs> and the problem, of course, is that you know there are there are services now that uh, that are, are trying, you know, a service that is launching now, like Google Google All Access. Blah blah blah. Uh, yeah. Is uh, is is <laughs> Yeah, I'm getting it wrong all the time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Is uh, is competing with you know uh, services that are already established, uh, and uh, there are yeah. also uh, other services that are due to come into the market, like uh, like Daisy later on this year. Exactly. And yeah. it's kind of like it's a bit of a mess when we talk about uh, uh, you know. And iTunes when, maybe. Yeah. And iTunes, maybe Apple with the iRadio service, and actually this links into uh, links pretty well into the the uh, story with Deezer, uh, where uh, apparently, uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, Deezer's, Deezer's CEO Axel Doshe mentioned that the company is interested in entering the U.S. and said we're looking for a partner in the U.S., maybe even an operator or a blue chip uh, uh, yeah. company uh, that you know could bring them a lot of subscribers uh, right away. For, uh, for example, so that would be, a, of course, a very uh, optimal entry point for them and of course it, one would question whether there's any other way to enter the US market these days as a subscription service unless you really want to bleed yourself out you know dry mm -hmm. bleed yourself dry trying to market the service and spending a huge amount of money as a standalone company so uh, Virginia do you think that these are gonna try and get in via a telecom provider for example or an ISP or something like that does that make yeah. sense I, I don't know. I was in a conference last week or two weeks ago with um, CEO of Desert, it's not Axel Doshi, it's Simon Balderou. He has a CEO 
because yeah. Sally is a president, yeah. I guess. Um, and uh, Simon said that um, they don't want to enter uh, the US. So because it's it's too much money, it's too complicated, they have to find a deal with a mobile operator. So, uh, yeah, I think it's... it's um, it's complicated for Deezer because in the US you have Deezer, you have Pandora, you have you know a lot of streaming services. You have maybe iTunes and and so Daisy. So yeah, it's it's um it's a competitive market, but they have to go to the US. Yeah. So it's a lot of money, uh, but they raised more than uh, two hundred million of euros, uh, I guess, last year. You know, with a Russian. Uh, investment fund, yeah. yeah, exactly the same as Warner. So, you know, in France, they say that they don't want to enter the US. So, <laughs> <laughs> maybe for the rest of the world, <laughs> they yeah. say that they want to enter the US, but I'm sure they want to enter the US, and I'm sure they try to build a partnership with a mobile operator, but it's pretty complicated because of Spotify. So, yeah. we'll yeah. see. Absolutely. And these are, you know, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of difference between of differences, sorry, between Deezer and Spotify. It's exactly the same thing, and um, so. Yeah. Where's the where's the sell point? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I'm waiting for Daisy now. Yeah. Really. Very we'll see what excited. happens. Uh, yeah, exactly. And Duncan, uh, do you reckon that Deezer has got a fighting chance if they're partnering with an operator? And also, do you think that there's maybe a, more of a market in the in the US now for different price point services? For example, we're all, we're all seeing how how well Move Music is doing with Cricket, and you know they're acquiring so many subscribers just by having that that much lower of an entry point uh, for for the subscription. And it just I, I kind of feel like uh, having yet another service that is priced exactly the same as all the others. It's going to be a bit of a disaster, like just because the market is quite saturated now. Do you think they can come in with a lower price point, for example? I mean, it's it's possible. I'm I, I'm personally not convinced that price point plays as big a, a role as, as as a lot of people say it does. I think much much more important is uh, your your catalog number one, your how easy your service is to use, the features, yeah. those kinds of things. Mm. I, I think price kind of actually comes fairly low because when you think about it, you know, ten dollars a month or whatever for uh, every song ever written, pretty much instant access to it is a pretty good deal. And so nine dollars a month isn't a very different deal. I think a lot of people will kind of make that that comparison in their head. Um, I was going to mention one more thing about the the Google thing, if I may. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I think it's very, very interesting that, that Google has managed to get all these deals and, and launch its streaming service before Apple did. Yeah. It wasn't very, very long ago that Google was like public enemy number one for, for most of the major labels and everything. And so for the fact that they've managed to do all these deals, get everything in place before Apple has managed to roll anything out, which has, and obviously Apple has historically been very friendly with the labels, is very interesting. And it will be very, very yeah, again, interesting to see what happens later this year with that. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I do wonder what kind of advances they gave. Uh, mm. I think Google was perhaps really keen on beating Apple to the punch yep. in, in the oh, streaming yeah. market, and so was probably prepared to pay a hell of a lot. They've, long, a they've of almost certainly Apple. thrown too much money at this, almost yeah. certainly. Yeah. yeah, it kind of feels like uh, the, the, the biggest winners of the Google Music Play Access thing uh, <laughs> yeah. are, are going to be the, you know, the majors that got really advances of mm. of the service I, I don't and even I, know and I wonder how much money of how much of that cash is going to trickle down to the oh, artists yeah. of course <laughs> of course <laughs> but what is exactly the name it's google access music it's it's, it's uh, google play all access music okay <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> I, I've also seen it down as Google Play Music All Access, which is even more confusing. But no, I, th I think you're right, Duncan. <laughs> I think you got the right name down. <laughs> at least it flows a little. It's been bit drilled there. into my head so many times over the yeah, last week. Yeah, yeah. At least it I've, flows. I've just about got it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, since uh, since it's a music show, I just wanted to mention in passing the sad news of the passing of uh, Raymond Zarek on the 20th of May, musician best known for his role as founding member or and keyboardist of the Doors, and uh, created, of course, a signature organ sound with the uh, Vox Continental and the Gibson G101. One, and he was 74 years old, so very sad news. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you're going to go and revisit some of the uh, Doors catalog. Actually, uh, I was at a press conference a couple of weeks ago where uh, 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 one of the founders of Electra uh, actually presented the new Doors iPad app, 
which is pretty cool and comprehensive and it's got the whole history of the band and uh, they've just re-released uh, a couple of weeks ago some of some uh, albums uh, mastered for iTunes when they when they got uh, they, where they went and got uh, the original tapes and, and retransferred them in high high res and stuff like that so uh, so yeah if you, if you like the doors go and check out the app uh, the, I think it's just called the doors you can find it on the on the app store uh, it's only like I think four or five bucks so it's pretty good value uh, great and then uh, you know uh, one more story that we're gonna talk about it's uh, it's all about numbers and uh, it was a story that was uh, presented by Merlin that disclosed uh, some facts and figures from a survey of its 20,000 plus label members uh, as well as an analysis of uh, 6.5 billion streams and so I love this story because it's, it's one of those where you actually you know I, I love doing the show because every single website picked on a different aspect of uh, uh, what the numbers said to them. So for example, Music Week went with the headline streaming now earns more than downloads for a third of EU indies. Uh, whilst, uh, for example, TechCrunch went with uh, uh, iTunes remains the biggest digital destination, Spotify and, and Amazon second and third. And streaming still just an opening act, which is like, it seems like a completely different take on, on the same numbers. <laughs> so uh, so let's look at these numbers actually. Uh, so 92% uh, of Merlin's uh, labels had streaming revenues uh, uh, growing in 2012. Uh, so over half of the labels increased streaming revenue uh, between 50 and 100 percent and 7 percent of labels said streaming revenues uh, remained flat uh, with only 1 percent saying that they declined so you know of course the, the, the global trend is growth for streaming and also for downloads you know over 60 percent of uh, members of Merlin said that their download growths had uh, had increased whilst uh, 24 percent uh, well about 20 percent or so uh, said that they had remained unchanged in, in, on the download market so of course still growth but uh, to a lesser extent and uh, uh, a more interesting number, of course, which is the one that Music Week uh, touts, uh, is that uh, you know there's uh, over thirty percent of um, uh, of European indies generated more income from streaming than downloads in twenty twelve, uh, which is really an impressive figure. So the numbers are interesting, especially when we look at five years ago, for example, or where there was a constant decline in in the industry, and you know sixty four percent of the Merlin labels reported. Uh, 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 gains in down in, you know in, in no sorry what was it uh 64 percent oh it's start on the start well uh, anyway more than half of the of the members of merlin had uh, uh, reported a growth in overall income which is great and it really shows that the industry is turning itself around uh, and of course the the industry's the indies industry restricted access to uh, physical distribution also plays a big part because they have to they had to concentrate on digital and i think this bet this bet is now paying off and so uh, you know uh virginie do, 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 what do you think about uh, the, the merlin numbers uh do you think that merlin itself has played a big part in helping these these members achieve what they have achieved uh, helping them shape the deals that they've made with some of the services for example it's very interesting, but, uh, you know, um, in the article of Music Week, uh, they said that iTunes uh, is the first music service for mailing members, and not Spotify, I mean, it's, it's so, it's not um, subscription, uh, yeah. but, you know, it's, it's download, uh, the first music service, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's great numbers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really. Um, uh, yeah, Merlin is. Um, I, I think Merlin has, deal, uh, has made a lot of deals with platforms uh, from iTunes to to Radio, for example. Uh, but as you know, in France, we are so different. Yeah. So as usual, so we had um, several deals with um, with uh, music platforms with SM. Uh, and as you know, we have uh, a worldwide deal with YouTube. Uh, which is different from the rest of the world and from the rest of, of Europe, and especially from Germany, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, our deal is, is really interesting for, for record labels uh, from the uh, SSM, uh, really. But uh, I have a question about uh, Gaz uh, in the UK. They yeah. said that more than 50% of their, um, yeah, it's 50%. Um, come from uh, streaming services and uh, iTunes, I guess. Fifty percent of the of the total amount. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's more yeah, more exactly. than half. More than half comes from 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 that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's that's quite good. It's great. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And yeah. there are there are a couple of interesting. Uh, players that come in the mix like for example eMusic is fourth uh, globally yeah, for, exactly. for Merlin which is a service that of course a lot of people are discounting and YouTube as YouTube is only the fifth 
Yeah, YouTube is only the fifth, and you know, uh, Beatport is seventh, and it's actually ahead of Audio. So that, those are very interesting global figures to look at when we when we think about how much uh, money the indies are making off the different streaming services. Uh, Duncan, do you, do you do you think Merlin? Uh, you know, of course, they have a very strong hand. They have almost, uh, I think, around ten percent of uh, global share of the of the recorded market. Uh, do you think they played a, a big part in helping their members achieve a decent, uh, you know, payouts from some of these services? I mean, it's 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 hard for me to say because I don't really sort of uh, look look too closely at, at Merlin on a yeah. on a regular basis. So uh, I'm not sure I can directly answer your question there with any authority. But I, 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 one thing I will say is that it's quite interesting to see the the traditional music publications like Billboard and Music Week say how great streaming is, and see TechCrunch say how great downloads are. I yeah. think that's <laughs> that's a really interesting switch that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, and, and and my personal take on the news is that it's kind of probably more on the TechCrunch side that. It, it, it's it's a powerful reminder, I think, that downloads are still king for the vast majority of people, um, or the vast majority of people who buy indie music in this case. Um, yeah. I mean, we've talked the entire show about streaming. We haven't really talked about downloads at all, and it's exactly the same in the rest of the media. But for yeah. most people, downloads are still the biggest deal. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And of of course, I think I think that's also a reason why Apple feels that it has such a strong hand to really try and get a good deal when it comes to its radio service mm -hmm. and why it's holding out for so long instead of just paying. You know, of course, it could pay, you know, half a billion in, in advances without even, you know, having any effect on its on its cash flow. But the fact that it doesn't want to do that and wants to get, uh, you know, the best deal they can is probably, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a, a direct... Uh, result of the fact that it's so strong in, in, in downloads and they're kind of like, well, you know, you need our business anyway, so you might as well. <laughs> That's almost certainly why they've let Google, you know, launch first and not jumped into it, you know, early because they've still got the, by far, the most lucrative digital music selling platform on the internet. Yeah. Yeah, and they want, they want to jeopardize that, of course. And uh, uh, I want to end uh, with talking about Pandora. Uh, Pandora, there's, there's always a bit of a kerfuffle uh, with Pandora uh, when it comes to, you know, the way that they're handling their artist relationships. And, uh, for example, uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, it was like it was Digital Music News that reported that they started sending out uh, emails to selected artists, yeah. asking them to... Uh, uh, write to their members of, of Congress with uh, a pre-written uh, letter by Pandora that sort of doesn't actively pitch uh, you know, a reduction in rates, but it kind of tries to highlight the importance for these artists of internet radio in, in, in order to be discovered, in order to, to, to get a wider following and the benefits of that for them. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, Digital Music News also reported that uh, sort of Pandora was sending alongside this letter uh, offer to access to a new platform that mm -hmm. would allow artists uh, to uh, um, access some of the data uh, that, they, that that Pandora has in the back end. So looking at where their tracks are being played, uh, which tracks get m most uh, thumbs up or th th thumbs down so that they can understand which tracks are getting the most uh, traction uh, and stuff like that. So it kind of like the way they shaped it on, on, on Digital Music News was a kind of a almost like a bribe in the sense that, you know, you were sending out this email requesting for them to send the letter, but also offering access to this new service, which kind of uh, was, uh, you know, if you, if you do this for us, then we'll provide you with access. Uh, so, uh, I mean, of course, I don't know whether that's uh, entirely true or not, or whether all the emails had both uh, offers uh, on them, but uh, the uh, music industry organizations like Sound Exchange, for example, responded very strongly uh, to this, uh, and, uh, you know, they, they're really not too happy about the way that uh, Pandora is trying to uh, to cozy up with, with their, their artists and trying to make them think that the rates that they're paying are, are even too high and, and that the benefits that they can get from Pandora are fantastic. Uh, so so it's, a bit a it's a bit of a complicated uh, issue here between Pandora, uh, Sound Exchange, uh, you know, uh, other music uh, artist organizations, and uh, Congress, uh, and of course the people that can propose new bills. It's a mess. Uh, so uh, Duncan, do you think that Pandora is doing the right thing by trying to sort of reach out to artists and get under the skin and sort of promoting how important <laughs> the, the service is to them. It, uh, it is a bit cheeky what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, it feels uh, like if, it. If, if, if they're, you know, if, if the allegations are true that, that yeah, that's the, they're promising access to new services if you do nice things for us. But yeah. then at the same time, you know, that's, that's business and that's, it's getting your, that's getting the best deal for your consumers and it's, you know, it's trying to get more music out to more people. That's all Pandora trying to do at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and, and it's up to us to say, to say whether they're happy with that or not. So as long as the, the decision is at the end of the day in the hands of the artists, then I think, you know, it's hard to criticize too much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh.
of course. And so now we'll, we'll, we'll be watching this Pandora story. Actually, I'll be I'll be in uh, Washington in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll uh, be in Washington. We'll be in Washington together <laughs> yeah. uh, for the for the world creators. Why, why can't I come? <laughs> <laughs> you should join in join uh, <laughs> uh, for the World Creators Summit. And there's going to be a lot of talk, I think, about uh, the new copyright reforms that are are being touted in the U.S. So there's going to be a very interesting conversations happening there on that front. And I'm going to be doing a bunch of interviews there. So uh, if you're interested in this side of things, uh, the more sort of legal. Uh, side on the royalty rates and all that you should probably tune into those interviews in a couple of weeks uh, and uh, also uh, uh, as far as the calendar goes for this week uh, Music Matters kicked off uh, uh, today and will be running through Friday in Singapore uh, the music conference has been described to be as one of the best places to go to for people that want to do business in Asia and I look forward to hearing what comes out of it and actually in order to put a bit of a spotlight on the region and in light of a recent episode on China uh, where uh, I admittedly had no idea what, what anybody was talking about and uh, you know, I think we were just kind of we just kind of read the story and went, yeah. I think that's that's pretty much the most we can say about this. Uh, I actually called in, uh, organized a special episode for next week, uh, which is going to have some collaborators uh, from uh, Music Weekly Asia, which you can find at Music Weekly, uh, sorry, Music MusicWeekly Asia, uh, and and they are experts, uh, of course, in, in in what's happening in the region from they're living in different different uh, territories uh, from, from from there, and we're going to talk about the most prominent uh, stories uh, and uh, developments of the market. Uh, in Asia, and also talk about what happened at Music Matters uh, uh, in the in the next couple of days. Uh, and so it's going to be a pretty comprehensive view on uh, on the Asian market and, and the opportunities that are happening there. So look out for next week's episode if you're interested in that kind of stuff. And uh, guys, it was great having you on. So first of all, I want to ask you, uh, what are you working on? And is there anything in particular that you want to plug or any articles that you've written, Duncan, that, that, you, that you'd like to show <laughs> No, off? not in particular. I mean, you yeah. can always find my website at duncangear.com um, yeah. or just Google my name or something. I, I imagine my name will be next to this video yeah. when it's up on the site. So yeah, you can always find more about me there Great. if you would like to hire me Great. awesome <laughs> and then how how was your trip to china i know that you oh it was phenomenal i had i had such a great time i went to a a Chinese music festival and I dressed up in a big flower suit to help promote my cousin's band. It was, oh, it was an awesome. amazing experience. <laughs> I've great. never had so many photos taken of me in one day in my life. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, I'm going in a few months, so I'm very excited about that. Oh, wow. Great. And so Virginie, uh, on your end, anything you want to plug or bands that you're working with that you want to point out to our listeners? Yeah, I, I'm working with a high boat uh, right now you know, on, on articles about direct to fast. So you can find my articles on uh, high boat. Great. And um, end of June, I will be in Jordan for uh, the Creative Institute. And we are working on um, how to help artists from the Middle East you know, to, to increase their visibility after yeah. the Arab Spring. So, yeah, if you're interested, maybe we can have a chat about the, the artists from the Middle East. Absolutely. It's, yeah. uh, it's not China, but you know, in the Middle East, it's very African Middle East. It's very, very interesting to to follow the artists and to follow their opportunities and what they do. Yeah, that's great. And of course, you know, if you're a listener and you, uh, you know, are an expert in uh, the market of a, a specific territory, please do email yeah. uh, Andrea at digitalmusictrends.com. I know I'm going to have uh, somebody from calling in from Bogota in a couple of weeks uh, that uh, has a, a music uh, tech a website uh, or music industry website. Uh, uh, for running from there and uh, you know of course uh, doing the show on Asia and trying to cover as much territory as possible in uh, actual uh, fa you know in, in, in reality which is uh, which yeah. is great and so, so thanks so much guys for coming on the show Thank and you. thanks for listening it's been a pleasure uh, Digital Music Trends is available on uh, many channels YouTube SoundCloud uh, uh, Mixcloud uh, iTunes of course most podcatchers the Stitcher TuneIn Radio and everywhere else so uh, you really have no excuse not to uh, tune in if you like the show and uh, yeah, check out digitalmusictrends.com and subscribe to the weekly newsletter that I send out every week with, uh, with the, the uh, updates on the Digital Music Trends show, which is this one, and the DMT one-to-one -one show where I interview individual companies on what they're doing right now. Thanks for listening and have a great week and until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.